Since the 1800s, one organization has protected crown and country from the evils of hell. The Royal Order of Protestant Knights, founded by Abraham van Helsing himself. And in their service, a vampire, born of tragedy and bound to Sir Integra Fairbrook Wingate's Helsing. The secret weapon of the Helsing organization brought to bear upon the impure souls of the living dead. N no, n no, the other one. Y yeah, her. Get ready for the final vampire of 2023 in this episode of... Monster Menagerie! Welcome to Monster Menagerie, brought to you by the Paladin Archives. Wow, we're finally here. The last vampire of 2023. Can you believe it? It's been a long road, but here we finally are. Saris Victoria. I'm not gonna lie. I was a little intimidated to analyze her. I'd heard some things about her series being rather dark, but you know what? Despite what everyone said about the Helsing anime, I found it concise, fast-paced, and honestly pretty funny most of the time. Hmm? What's that, Maddie? Team what, Star? Doesn't count? Well, how long are the real episodes? They're what? Welcome, everyone, to Monster Menagerie. I'm the Cran named Mason, and I haven't slept in three days. But I got through the anime, and you know what? I'm only mostly scarred by the copious amounts of blood, sacrilege, and flat-out ra- Welcome to Monster Menagerie. It's Saris Victoria. Before we get into the analysis, I want to give a shout-out to our Discord server. You can find a link down in the description. Right now, we're having a fan vote to see which of the vampires we've covered this year you most adore. Rules and information are all in the Monster Menagerie channel. You can also see when we stream on Twitch and when new YouTube videos, like this one, are uploaded. If you want to share which vampire you think deserves the top spot, make sure you stop by and cast your vote. I'll be mentioning the fan choice in the December 2023 Monster Menagerie. Okay, that's enough stalling. Let's go ahead and take a look at the one and only police girl, Saris Victoria. Saris Victoria was born in England and immediately life sucked. Her father was a respected police officer, but he upset the wrong people and, uh, was unalived right in front of little Saris's eyes. Hiding in a closet, she also had to witness the murder of her mother, followed by the, uh, well, uh, let's say desecration of her body, because, uh, I don't think YouTube will hit me for that word. <laughs> Saris was in and out of the foster system, looked at as a problem child. She had issues with violence, rebellion, and other problems stemming from her tragic childhood. Despite this, she grew up to become a police officer, and a very upbeat and kind one at that. Along with her partners, she responded to word of a disturbance in the village of Cheddar. And this is where she met her first vampire, a priest. The vampire had made ghouls out of his victims and was intent on adding Saris to the list. Well, okay, not actually. In reality, he intended to rip. And that's when the vampire Alucard appeared. He gave her a real non-choice. He shot through her, ostensibly to hit the vampire's heart. The problem I have with this is that, first, Alucard is an amazing shot with vampire aiming, which he teaches Saris later in that episode. And he's only like 10 feet away, maybe? And the vampire's head is clearly visible. He chose to kill Saris, or rather, wound her mortally and force her to choose vampirism to save her life. She never calls him out on this. In any case, she's then brought into the Helsing Organization, a group that has been hunting vampires and protecting the world since the 1800s. <laughs> Amateurs. Under the leadership of Sir Integra Fairbrook Wingate's Helsing, and as the, uh, servant? Slave. 
offspring uh, of Alucard, she grows into a fine agent. She gets wrapped up in a Nazi plot to destroy London and, I guess, Washington, D.C. off-camera and ends up fighting just the weirdest, grossest, most confusing cast of weirdos. And I think that sums it up. And we only had to discuss terribly upsetting topics twice. That's pretty good for this anime. As I said before, Ceres is bright, cheerful, and upbeat, despite the situation she's found herself in. The anime shows her as a detached, almost cruel child while in the foster care system. So I have to imagine there was some event off camera that helped turn her life around. Perhaps it was becoming a cop to carry on her father's legacy. In any case, she handles the whole vampire thing quite well, most of her protests coming off more like a like a child whining about the doctor. She goes through a set of I can't do it. Yes, you can, police girl. Moments with Alucard all revolving around her losing her humanity as her vampire nature slowly engulfs her. She seems to hate her coffin and, for at least the bulk of the anime, absolutely refused to drink blood claiming it feels like she's losing something if she does. She's absolutely loyal to her master Alucard, which I have to imagine is at least a little bit part of the process of her being turned. This also transfers over to Alucard's master, Integra. And, um, Integra treats Ceres in much the same way she does Alucard. She mostly hates hurting people, but... When she goes into vampire mode, she gains a literal bloodlust. She's able to annihilate foes left and right without thought, though it's not uncommon for her to be shaken by it later. She tries to maintain a sliver of humanity, such as eating human food, but it's just a desperate way of clutching to her last vestiges of who she was. She seems to mostly get along with Pip, the mercenary hired by Helsing, after the death of literally all their other agents at the mansion. The two bicker, as a good English-French duo should, though Pip is mostly concerned with getting in her What? I was going to say good graces. Sheesh. When pushed, she can summon a courage and power from deep within, though it seems she's at her strongest when she turns to the concern and care she has for her friends. Yeah, even in Helsing, there's a bit of the power of friendship. Despite this positive attitude, it doesn't take a lot to exploit her self-doubt and fear, causing her to retreat into herself. But with the aforementioned power of her friends, she can usually pull out of it. <laughs> she's chipper, she's cute, she could crush your head in her... Palm, no wonder pretty much everyone in the show, and the fan base, likes her. Hoo wee, we have a big one to dissect here. Now, I'm going to divide this into two parts. You see, when Ceres is turned by Alucard, the complete transformation is denied to her until she drinks blood. Alucard offers to let her drink his on a mission, and she declines. She turns away all but the most necessary offers until, finally, she has no choice but to drink from Pip. It almost sort of saves his life. Like, he was dying, but she was moments from death herself. In the end, really, it just makes him her familiar. The point is, I'm dividing this section into two parts, before she drank Pip's blood and after. Trust me, there's a significant difference. Anything she can do in the former will transfer to the latter, so I won't really mention it. Let's get started with the basics. She's fast, she's incredibly strong, she can see insane distances with her third eye, and uh, well, that's about it actually. Uh, but trust me, those things are pretty dang impressive. Let's look at the third eye. On her first real mission, Ceres has given her first rifle. It's far too big to be used by a normal person, at least without it being mounted, and it doesn't even have a scope. Yet, with the prompting of her master Alucard, she imagines a third eye and aims with it, taking a shot at the fleeing target like a proper vampire. <laughs> Ceres notes when she's preparing to snipe the fleeing Jessica that the target is Five. 
I'm an absolute nerd, so let's actually try to figure out how far that shot is. Ceres' rifle appears to be a unique creation of the anime, but we know it fires impressively sized 13.7mm rounds. That would put it squarely in the category of heavy caliber, a gun that should be mounted and used for anti-tank or aircraft. More on that later. The closest analog I could find to get me in the ballpark is the Mauser 13.2mm, which has a muzzle velocity of about 785 meters per second. From the time Saris fires the gun to the time Jessica is hit is about 4 seconds by my count. Let's go back to my favorite formula, speed equals distance over time. Rearrange to solve for distance and we have distance equals speed times time. 785 meters per second times 4 seconds comes out to 3.14 kilometers or almost 2 miles. That actually tracks with her shots in later episodes. Next. Let's look at speed and strength before she drank the blood of Pip Bernadotte. Stick with me guys, this one's going to be a bit of a walk. When she and Alucard head to Ireland to take care of some vampires in a large mansion, we see her run through a crowd of ghouls once she's frenzied. Zooming out, we can see Sarah sitting on the steps of the manor. Her cannon height is 167 centimeters, or about 5 foot 5. In this shot, we can get a clear look at her rifle. Doing pixel measurements, we can determine that Saris is 454 pixels tall and her rifle is 282 pixels long. That means her gun is roughly 103.5 centimeters long or about 3 feet 5 inches. Take a breath guys, we're only getting started. Using that, we can determine the width of the doors on the mansion in this image. The length of her gun is approximately the length of each of these double doors, so double the length to get 334 centimeters, and now we have a ruler for the mansion. From end to end, it's 11 door lengths, so 36.74 meters. Conveniently, that door length also appears to be just about the distance from the start of one window to the end of the next. Now, let's get our time. At 30 frames per second, it takes Saris 34 frames to move from window to window. That means she covered 334 centimeters in about 1.2 seconds. Speed equals distance over time, so we have 2.78 meters per second or 6 miles per hour. Huh. Man, I, I gotta really stop calculating these things, it's ruining the movie magic. It's definitely not Usain Bolt levels here, but then again this is her pre-true vampire form. The anime makes it clear she's super fast. But like Edward in Twilight, the measurements don't bear this out. Maybe we can look at something else. During that same hallway run, we see her dodging bullets fired by the ghouls. A fine chance to check her reaction speed. Most of those are small arms, pistols and the like. We see she's about three windows away from the horde, which we know is about 10 meters thanks to our pixel measurements from the outside. Average muscle velocity for a 9mm round is roughly... 370 meters per second, meaning the bullet reaches her in 0.027 seconds. The average human can react within 0.25 to 0.3 seconds, meaning Sarah's reaction time is easily 10 times faster than a normal human. Yeah, I guess movies and anime are just bad at depicting speed. Whatever. Let's look at her strength, pre-pit blood of course. Easily the most impressive scene for Sarah's in the anime, to that point, we find her here defending the Helsing Mansion by sniping enemy missiles from kilometers away with this. Harkonnen 2. According to Pip, this big brother to the Harkonnen, her signature gun, has a gross weight of 345 kilograms. Assuming it's divvied up somewhat evenly, we can guess that each gun is around 86.25 kilos or 190 pounds each, for a total of 760 0.5 pounds for our US watchers. An impressive amount for so small a person to hold without effort, <laughs> but check this out. These are the kind of guns that should be mounted, anchored to something so they don't go flying back and kill their operator. Newton's laws are a bitch, whatever force comes out the front also sends the gun backward with just as much force. And with a little back of the napkin calculations, I've estimated each blast from Harkonnen 2 generates about two to three thousand newtons of force. If you don't know your science, you can visualize it like this. The average human male weighs about 200 pounds. If you aimed Harkonnen 2 at the ground, 
and pulled the trigger, it would rocket you up about 10.7 feet, or 3.27 meters. That's one shot. Saris absorbs this effortlessly with a belt feed. She holds the weight of two adult men, one under each arm, and rapid fires 30 millimeter shells that could send one of those adult men 10 feet into the air with each shot. Not bad for her underpowered form. But once Saris drains Pip Bernadotte, all bets are off. She becomes a true vampire, feeling and looking much more like her master, Alucard. In this form, she gains better rapid regeneration from her wounds, uh, a blood shadow thing that comes out from her arm, effectively replacing it after she loses it in a fight to a Nazi, uh, the ability to fly, and uh, I think more speed and strength. In her fight with First Lieutenant Zorin Blitz, she grabs her foe's head and grinds it into the wall as she runs down the Helsing Mansion's hall. During this maneuver, she moves at a pace of six strides per second. At five foot five, 167 centimeters, that's about 70.125 centimeters per stride. The average human stride is 0.45 times their height. 70.125 times six equals 420.75 centimeters, or about 4.2 meters per second. That's, that's 9.4 miles per hour. Well, at least she's getting faster, right? Okay, let's give her one last chance. In her fight with the silent werewolf known only as the captain, the two end up in a hole filled with stolen Nazi loot. This shot gives us a good distance between them just before Saris launches a kick. Looking at the floor, we can see uniform tiles, each about the size of Sarah's shin. Guess what it's time for? Pixel measurements! Once again, Saris is 5'5", five five, or 167 centimeters tall. In this shot, her whole body is a height of 295 pixels. Her shin is about 98 pixels, which makes it about 55.5 centimeters, or almost 22 inches. That's close enough for government work. After all, I do technically work for the BDA. Counting the tiles in the scene, we see, let's be generous, seven tiles. At 55.5 centimeters each, that puts them about 3.33 meters away. From the moment she makes her kick sound, to the moment her foot meets with the captain's position, it takes 14 frames. That's just under half a second, which means she launches herself at 6.6 .6 meters per second, or 14.76 miles per hour. Okay, I give up. Let's move on to strength, because, buddy, she has that in spades. Now, I really want to tell you about this scene here. Ceres is on the Zeppelin Deus Ex Machina. Yes, that is its real name. And in her fight with a Nazi werewolf, she rips a bomb out of the wall. Based on the design, the size, and the fact that it's on a World War II era Zeppelin, I think it's an SC-2500 Max, a bomb weighing in at an impressive 2.5 tons. She rips through the steel wall to pull it free, and then just chucks it with one hand. But sadly, I can't dwell on it because she immediately outdoes herself. In the final showdown with the Major, Millennium's leader sits comfortably behind a glass shield. Saris fires on him in Integra's command, but her guns won't pierce the glass. She empties an entire clip from Harkonnen 2, but it just won't break. So, learning from her previous encounter that Nazi Zeppelins have all kinds of neat treats in the walls, she rips open the floor and pulls out this. That, my friends, is a flak gun. What is a flak gun, you might ask? A cannon specifically made to turn aircraft into raining debris. That is an 88mm anti-tank, anti-aircraft artillery gun. I'll go into it more later, but suffice it to say this gun is heavy. 7.4 metric tons heavy. And Saris rips it out through the metal framework of the Zeppelin, one-handed, then fires it without a bit of recoil. Just for kicks, the recoil on this particular beauty would be 6,217,880 newtons of force. Remember how Harkonnen 2 can knock you 10 feet into the air? My conservative estimate says that if you aimed this gun at the ground, 
you'd go sailing about 11,000 feet into the air. <laughs> well, what's left of you would. Not bad, huh? Not as fast as I imagined, but her demon shadow zippy power thing seems to be relatively fast. Can't really get a good measure of it, what with her pinballing everywhere. If you check out the Major's map, you can get a good idea of where the Helsing Mansion is in relation to London, but I have no idea how long it took her to get from the mansion to London, so we can't get a speed. Let's just say... fast. Going over Saris Victoria's physiology, huh? I'm, uh, having flashbacks to Lady Domitresque. It's okay. I can, I can be mature about this. Saris is physically about 18. She doesn't seem to have any pointed ears or anything, and for the most part, she looks perfectly human. Now, after her absorption of Pip, she gets a few notable distinctions. Her eyes remain red. She has a blood shadow arm that can do all kinds of cool stuff. Oh, and of course she has fangs. When she wants them. Prior to her drinking of Pip's blood, she had a few notable weaknesses. First off, she has a bloodlust that she had to fight any time she was faced with the stuff. Despite this, she absolutely refused to drink any blood, and this left her a shadow of a vampire, at least in Alucard and Integra's eyes. Without the extra strength the blood would give her, she was forced to stay in a coffin for her slumber. Her exposure to sun seemed limited. We do see her at one point grabbing food with Pip, but she's covered pretty heavily. This checks out, since we see Rip Van Winkle demonstrating something similar on the deck of a ship. Beyond this, there's not much notable about her, physically speaking. Yep, nothing stands out. Now, Anderson even remarks how human she seems, so there's definitely nothing else to point out. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't hold back anymore. I have to talk about the elephant in the room. Guys, let's face it. Saris Victoria has some impressive guns. I think my favorite part about analyzing this episode was how seriously the creators took their guns. They not only made them true to life, with a few notable exceptions, but made sure to let us all know exactly what the specifications for them are. Walter lovingly describes the jackal in Harkonnen, Alucard explains the rounds in his pistol, and even the Major takes a moment to appreciate Saris Cannon's... er, Cannon. So, I want to take a brief moment to go over Saris' firepower, because, frankly, it's something a paladin will be dealing with if they go up against her. Walter seems to have either made or ordered the construction of most of the important guns in the series, and man, that guy has a thing for the Dune franchise. From the first rifle she uses to snipe Jessica from a couple miles away, all the way to, well, technically the flat cannon at the end, they're all sort of part of a line called Harkonnen. Let's look at what I'm calling Harkonnen Zero. It's the first rifle Walter presents to her, and yes, I know it has a weird name in the manga that I can't pronounce, but it says Harkonnen on it in the anime. This little beauty here uses a box magazine that the internet movie Firearms Database suggests holds between 10 to 15 rounds. It fires 13.7 millimeter shells, which, as I mentioned before, starts us off snugly in the heavy caliber category. This gun is clearly intended to be mounted, possibly for anti-tank or other vehicular purposes. Saris claims the gun is huge. Yeah, I hardly felt any recoil at all. Best of all, we see that it has quite the range, and when paired with Saris's vampire sight, can take out a target at extremely long distances with extreme prejudice. Next up is her signature weapon, the Harkonnen itself. I'll let Walter explain since he seems to love the weapon so much. The Harkonnen a 30mm anti-freak cannon, designed to be used with both depleted uranium shells and exploding incendiary shells, this weapon will destroy all but the most heavily armored of targets. Breech-loaded, single shot, with massive 30mm shells, this thing is a beast. It weighs in at 120 pounds, unloaded. No human could ever hope to wield this thing unless it was attached to a solid mount. But Saris wields it like any other normal rifle, even using it to snipe. 
This gun embodies what it means to be a vampire in the Helsing anime. But of course, that doesn't mean perfection can't be improved upon. Meet Harkonnen 2. According to Pip Bernadotte, it's semi-automatic, weighs in at 345 kilos, and fires those same lovely 30 millimeter shells at a maximum range of 4 kilometers. But this one is belt-fed. Those drums you see on her back are filled with rounds, and it even has a kickstand to help her get really steady, and probably to help with some of the recoil. Saris is able to bullseye 35 out of 35 missiles launched at the mansion. Keep in mind, she's technically firing from the hip since she's using each gun one-handed. I did the math earlier, and each gun is at least 190 pounds, so she's holding a human being under each arm when she's firing. This thing is a monster. But my favorite, the unofficial Harkonnen 3, comes in her final fight with the Major. Why call it that? Because a chubby little Nazi described it as such. I promised I'd mention it earlier, so here we are. This is an 88mm flat cannon designed by the German army to combat tanks and aircraft, known as the Oct Oct, the 88. Its whole purpose was to pluck aircraft out of the sky that were too high up for more conventional weaponry. It can fire 15 to 20 rounds per minute with a muzzle velocity of 840 meters per second and has a maximum range of 9,900 meters and Ceres wields it like it's nothing. Well, we certainly have something to talk about in threat levels now. It's the last analysis of the year, but just in case you don't know how these things work, I'll go over it one more time. You see, my job as a mason for the Paladin Order means that I analyze the threat of any particular obstacle a Paladin in the field may be facing, and report back to them, usually with recommendations th that they don't follow. To this end, we use a threat level scale that goes from 1 to 10, with it being heavily weighted toward the bottom. Seriously, we'll probably never see a 10. Or if we do, we, we won't be able to do anything about it. <laughs> now, a 1 on this scale is something like, um, oh... Your cat has begun channeling the malevolent spirit of a general from Three Kingdoms, China. Let's say, uh, Jia Hao Dun. Hey, it happens more often than you'd think. It's hard to tell when a cat is possessed. Uh, point is, a single paladin should be able to head out and assess the situation and fix it. A 10? That means the world is headed for a disaster of biblical proportions. Old Testament, real wrath of God type stuff. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies, rivers and seas boiling, 40 years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Look, I, I gave you 10 other examples of a level 10, let me just have this one. I want to make something clear. I gave Celine a lot of crap for being a vampire that uses guns. And you know what? I stand by it. I fully believe that the movie Underworld could replace the vampires with elves, and nothing would fundamentally change about the movie. But with Ceres, she isn't using her guns instead of her vampire abilities, she's combining them. And that, my friends, might just make her the most dangerous vampire on the list. Not only is she strong, strong enough to lift four cars at once, she's able to see in complete darkness for kilometers. Celine uses twin pistols, nothing particularly powerful. What she did could easily be replicated by a normal human, but Ceres has a gun, well, guns, plural, that only a vampire could wield. That is why I'm so concerned about her, threat-wise. Sure, she could impale you with her fist in melee, send you flying across the room with a single finger, but that's only the beginning of her abilities. That was before she got juiced up on pit blood. No, the worst part of this is that she can kill you from miles away, utterly obliterate you, and you'd never even know you were being hunted. Rather than replace all the things that make a vampire deadly with gunplay, she marries the two concepts into something dreadful, something incredible, something dangerous. And because of that, I think I need to rank her threat level 6. As strong as Dracula, probably as fast as Edward, 
and with a freaky shadow arm that can impale you or rip up fun surprises from underground, she's certainly going to be a challenge to put down, and I hate what I think I have to do to accomplish that. Typical ammunition will be virtually useless on her advanced form. Sunlight isn't going to be reliable enough as a weapon. If it's her underpowered version, we could try and locate her coffin and maybe just seal it? We can see from her trip to Brazil that she needs to travel in her coffin, and the tie-down straps around it are apparently more than enough to keep it sealed as she begs to be let out. If we're facing this Ceres, that's my go-to plan. It minimizes casualties on both sides. Assuming we can't, though, I wonder what our options even are. Disorienting tactics are likely to be pointless with her third eye. Flashbang, tasers, sonic disruption. If there's anything the anime teaches us, it's that physical force is the only answer against a vampire. Garlic, crosses, dead man's blood, it's all pointless. Though, they do use blessed ammunition, often silver which suggests that they themselves might be weak to it. If I knew what Anderson's bayonets were made out of, that might be helpful. I think we can safely assume they're blessed. She can dodge bullets, see us coming from miles away, and snipe us before we even know she's in the country. I feel like subterfuge is going to be necessary and worse, psychological warfare. Her biggest weakness is her own insecurity, failing those around her feeling inadequate, and I think it might stem from her parents' death. If a particularly confident paladin can exploit this, it could open her up for attack. She's naive and doesn't seem to be able to sense auras other than Alucard's. I imagine getting an undercover paladin near her for recon would be a good step. A preemptive strike would be absolutely imperative. We don't want her hunting us. Because of her lineage from Alucard, she should be treated like an old world vamp. Probably have to skip stewardship paladins and request a specialist all the way from the patronage. Normally, I might suggest overwhelming force, but <laughs> that's what the vampire Nazis tried, and she didn't even flinch in that fight. She's quick enough to pinball around and rip off all the paladins' heads without breaking a sweat. No, whatever we do, it has to be sneaky. After all, we're not monsters, so we can't match her in a fight. We have to hit her hard, from a distance, keep the pressure up, mess with her head, and probably finish her off up close and personal. Dispatch Patronage Level Specialist, Anti-Freak Masters. Heavy vestment to help in melee combat. Armor is irrelevant from range as target utilizes too heavy a caliber weapon to matter. Use psychological tactics to approach and monitor the subject. If possible, locate the target's coffin. Focus on ranged attacks, hit and run. Prepare patronage level melee specialist armed with blessed blades. Really quick, I want to indulge in super geekdom because after all, Saris is a monster hunter. So let's quickly imagine what it might be like if Ceres was dispatched to take down all the other vampires on this year's list. I'll give each one a difficulty ranking of 1 to 5, with 1 being the easiest. Let's go. Number 1. Dracula, 1931, ranking 1. Ceres casually shows up during the day, makes a few confused comments about him not moving, and stakes him. Probably just with her own hand. Number 2. Edward Cullen, ranking 2. Sarah scouts him out, is creeped out by his behavior around Bella, and puts a 13.7mm round through his chest. 3. Lady Domitresque, ranking 3. Listen, Ethan took her down and he didn't have Harkonnen. Lady or dragon form, she snipes her from the top of the nearby mountains. Possible melee fight that ensues ends with literally pushing the barrel of the Harkonnen down Domitresque's throat. 4. Michael Morbius, ranking 3. Tracks him, sets up outside his location, and waits. She takes shots at night from a distance. It's possible that Morbius fills this and dodges, 
sniper battle ensues, and it ends up with her impaling him with her shadow fist as he tries to summon a bat Hadouken. Number 5, Marceline the Vampire Queen, ranking 4. This one, she snipes from a distance with Harkonnen. If Marceline survives the first volley, she'll probably switch over to incendiary rounds and just pelt the giant monster form that she'll take. Now, when I suggested the paladins use a mob tactic, you know, just full-on mafia hit, yeah, any one of Ceres' single guns would probably be equivalent to that same force. Number 6, Louis de Pont du Lac, ranking 1. Ceres investigates and locates her target and drops him with her basic rifle. If he does try to run, it's just Jessica all over again. Number 7, Nandor the Relentless, ranking 1. Once she stops laughing, <laughs> she probably feels bad for him and uh, escorts him to a facility to monitor him. He pisses her off eventually, and she literally tears his head off with one hand, and then apologizes. Number 8, Celine, ranking 2. Celine will actually fire back, making this a fun gunfight. In the end, though, Ceres can tank whatever round Celine has. Celine can't tank a 30mm round, silver, UV, or otherwise. Number 9, Count Von Count, ranking 3. Dangerous. He's got the ability to undo her damage and even entrance her. Likely, she sticks with the tried and true snipe it with the Harkonnen tactic. It's a classic for a reason. Number 10, All Rocks, ranking 4. Now this would be a good fight. I imagine her first volley nearly obliterating All Rocks, but then he turns into a mist, forcing her to reconsider her tactics. Melee combat ensues, with her shadow arm becoming very involved. All Rocks turns into a dragon and begins to rain down his power on her, only to be met with a mouthful of Harkonnen. Score Ceres. That was nuts. We have a new queen on top of our danger scale. But come on, when you saw this, did you really think his lineage would be any less? Personally, I'm in love with this particular series. And if you've already seen it, or are unsure about watching it, or just don't have time, I wholeheartedly recommend you take a look at Team Four Stars Helsing Ultimate Abridged. It is amazing. For being a YouTube parody, they really went all out on it. The later episodes actually managed to capture the emotions of the original while still being transformative and concise. Huh, I guess that's everyone now. Eleven vampires down. You know what that means? The next step is yours. For December, we're comparing all 11 vampires to crown our king or queen of the vampires for the year. We're going to compare their powers, their danger levels, their bloodlust, and their allure to see which one is the most vampiric of all these vampires. And you can participate. If you head to our Discord server, you'll find the Monster Menagerie channel where we have a link to the tier maker list of all the vampires. You can submit up to four tier lists, one for each of the four categories, Allure and Charm, Danger Level, Powers, and Bloodlust. Take a screenshot of your tier list and make sure it's properly marked with which category you're doing. Then, either drop it on our Discord server or on Twitter with the hashtag Paladin Archives, or you can direct it straight to me with at Paladin Archive, no S on that one. If you want to go the Twitter route, I have a link to the tier maker list down in the description. Oh, I can't wait for this video. I have some amazing guests who volunteered to lend their expertise on the matter, so it will be well worth your time to stop by. Until then though, please make sure to like and subscribe and make sure you hit that bell. We stream over on Twitch at Paladin Archives three times a week, usually with some pretty relaxed games. I hope we see you over there. Wow, the end of all the vampires, and I still don't even know what next year is going to bring. Werewolves, demons, ghosts, witches, other monster hunters. What kind of things would you like me to analyze next year? The sky's the limit, my friend, so feel free to drop it down in the comments, or even better, hit up our Discord and join in on the conversation. Before we go, I want to recognize some of the awesome people in our community that have taken the time to create some amazing art. Karma. 
Utility. Sath. Hallis. Annabelle. Quinn. And the greatest. Thank you, everyone. It means so much to me that you care enough to draw these things. You're all so amazing. Well, I guess that's it for today. December is almost on us, so I gotta get going. There's a secret Santa sign up in the break room, and Maddie says if I don't get there quick, I'll end up with Mason Douglas down in processing. Man, all that guy ever wants is sludge samples. It's concerning. <laughs> Until next time, keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's hiding out there. Releasing Control Art Restriction Systems 3, 2, 1. Approval of Situation A recognized. Commencing the Cromwell Invocation. Ability restrictions lifted for limited use until the enemy has been rendered silent.